statistically improbable things have to come about through an orderly, comprehensible process. Evolution by natural selection is, I think, the only such process ultimately that we know that's capable of doing that. So I wouldn't like to say that evolution by natural selection has got to be going on on any planet in the universe where there is life. But something equivalent to it has got to be going on, such that simplicity builds up into complexity by a comprehensible process. You cannot just say, oh, complexity just happened. You can say, uh, maybe hydrogen just happened, because hydrogen is relatively simple. But what you can't say is something complicated enough to, shall we say, design the laws of physics or design life, or design a bird's wing. Something complicated enough to think that out is the, is the very kind of thing which is not just going to happen spontaneously. And when you think about it, creationists use exactly that argument themselves when they say something as complicated as an eye or a bacterial flagellum couldn't just happen by chance. Well, of course it couldn't. That's why we need natural selection. And by the same token, exactly, God couldn't just happen. Okay. It's an interesting idea that I think I've encountered somewhere in your works that you, you pose the idea, and I, I feel the need to issue that health warning again, that this, this is not something that you're claiming as true. You might like to just confirm that in your answer. Um, that it's possible that elsewhere in the universe, beings could have evolved to such an extent that they might even appear godlike to us if, if we were ever to encounter yeah, them. Yes, I mean, when, when, when I say I don't believe in God, somebody might say to me, well, how do you know there's not some superlatively complicated and intelligent godlike being um, orbiting Alpha Centauri uh, who would be so obviously godlike that were we ever to meet this character or the, those characters, we would fall on our knees and worship them? And I think that's perfectly plausible. I think. If you think about it, um, if, if we could fly in a Boeing 747 to, uh, uh, to the Middle Ages or to the Dark Ages and suddenly land by the side of an Anglo-Saxon village, I mean, they would undoubtedly think we were gods and they'd fall down and worship us. By the same token, um, that I bet there are somewhere in the universe, because the universe is so large, I bet that somewhere in the universe there are beings even more advanced relative to us than we are advanced relative to a Dark Age Anglo-Saxon peasant. And so we probably would fall on our knees and worship <coughs> them. But they would not be gods in the sense of things that have just happened spontaneously. They themselves would have had to have come into existence via either evolution or something like evolution, which has the same property of building up complexity step by step through slow, gradual degrees from primordial simplicity. They've had a long time to do it. It's only taken life on this planet about three and a half to four billion years to evolve to our level of technology. There's about 14 billion years in the universe as a whole to play with. And so there's been plenty of time for superior technologies to develop. They might well be godlike, but they would not be gods in the sense that they would not have been there from the start. They would have come about through slow, gradual degrees. Intelligence, creativity, design, complexity, these are things that all come late into the universe. They cannot exist right from the start. And could alien, advanced beings of that kind possibly have created life on Earth? Well, uh, this is a speculation that um, actually the great Francis Crick um, mentioned, I think somewhat tongue-in-cheek. Uh, he, at the end of one of his books, uh, he talked about a, an idea that he and his colleague Leslie Orgel had had called directed panspermia. And the idea is that uh, bacterial life on Earth was seeded in the nose cone of a rocket that was sent from some distant planet, uh, perhaps by a, an alien civilization that uh, didn't wish its form of life to go extinct and therefore wished to propagate its form of life which, according to the speculation, was a DNA protein-based form of life. So this alien civilization stuffed the nose cone of a rocket with, with bacteria and launched it into space. It crash-landed on Earth and started life, life here. Now, Crick and, and Orgel, uh, I, I think, were, were speculating in a sort of tongue-in-cheek way. They were acknowledging that the origin of life on this planet is a very difficult problem that hasn't been solved. Leslie Orgel himself 
uh, is one of the leading workers on that, on that topic. And it just seemed reasonable to them to, to, to be open to the possibility that life might have originated elsewhere. But even that speculation, of course, doesn't absolve us from the responsibility to think of a way in which life could have originated somewhere in the universe. It just gives rather more time. It gives us 14 billion years rather than only 4 billion years uh, <laughs> in, in, for, for that to happen. Actually, it's not 4 billion, because, of course, life originated sometime before we see the first bacterial fossils, which is about 3.5 billion years. And the Earth itself is only 4.6 billion years old. But you're not suggesting, are you, that that actually is No, I don't believe that for a moment. I mean, I think, I think life did originate on, on this planet, uh, and um, it, we have a responsibility to try to think out how. But um, I, I don't think we need to resort to such an uh, outlandish hypothesis as directed panspermia. But it's up to, us, to all scientists to be open-minded. But nevertheless, it is, it is a really hard concept, I think, for for those of us who are not scientists, to get our heads around. As far as we know, the Earth is the only planet in the whole universe, as far as we know, that actually has intelligent life on it, or any kind of life that, that we're sure of. And the chances of that happening seem to be so infinitesimal. Why should that be? Don't you, can you at least understand why people who are prone to a theistic interpretation of life might say, well, look, isn't that just too amazing? to have just happened by chance? Doesn't that sort of indicate that there's a God who wanted it and created us, created Earth with the moon in the right place and with Jupiter in the yeah. right place and yes. with a friendly sun and a friendly solar system and all the rest of it? Yes. Um, well, th there's no doubt that, that our situation on this planet is a comparatively <coughs> friendly. I, I don't wish to concede a, a, at all that that I don't that, that is only one life form in the universe. I think it's probable that there is uh, quite a lot of life in the universe. Um, I think it's probably a very rare phenomenon, which means that uh, any one of these little islands of life is probably rather unlikely to encounter any other of these islands mm -hmm. of, of, of life. So it may be that all islands of life are blissfully unaware of each other's existence. Um, it's a genuinely open question how rare life is. Now, let's go to one extreme and entertain the possibility that this is indeed the only planet in the entire universe where there is life. And then we have to say, well, um, what, what can we deduce from that? Uh, one thing that Paul has just pointed out is that um, we can say that this planet has certain very friendly properties. It's exactly the right distance from a star, from its star. If it was, it's the so-called Goldilocks zone. Mm -hmm. If it was um, it's Goldilocks in the sense of just not too hot, not too cold, but just, just right. Um, uh, it's in the Goldilocks zone in the sense that, that if it were any closer to the sun, all the water would boil. And if it were any further from the sun, all the water would freeze. So there's quite a narrow band of orbits uh, in which uh, water remains liquid. Which, which we need. Um, there's also the moon, which has a certain stabilizing effect, which makes, um, uh, which makes it possible for life to, or makes it easier, at least, for life to have evolved. There's Jupiter, which acts as a great big hoover uh, to stop too many um, asteroids and, uh, hitting us. Uh, quite, some do, nevertheless, but, but, it's, but it's rare. One of the reasons is that Jupiter's there, acting as a great gravitational sink, uh, pulling these missiles um, away. So there is a lot going for us in this solar system. And so there damn well has to be, because we're here. I mean, obviously, ev if, even if we're the only form of life in the, in the universe, we would have to be that the one planet where we are would have to be a planet which has those favorable characteristics, however rare such a planet is. Now, knowing we don't know, but calculating, speculating, well, more than speculating, um, it's an, an informed calculation about how many planets there are in the universe. There must be actually a very large number uh, which have at least those um, complacent properties uh, friendly to life. It may still be that only one of them uh, is, a actually has life. And um, that has a very interesting consequence, which I perhaps briefly Please, explore. Yes. Um, 